Hi, excited, whoa, <laughs> excited. Maybe not quite that excited to be here today um, and talk to you guys about AI. It is hard to come to a group this broad and touch on things that uh, are interesting to everyone. So what I tried to do was stay closer to now. So you'll see the title is AI in 2018. So what's happening now? And give maybe a few references to the past. I'm excited about AI. I came back into the field a few years ago. Um, I've always used it tangentially um, in my career. It was always a tool to me. Uh, and I came back in about four years ago because of what was happening. So let's talk some about that. Does anyone recognize this? No one's raising their hand. So this happened in April. And what happened in April was, um, it may not be the first, but the first well-publicized and known about art generated by AI that was for, purchased for about $15,000 Canadian. It was a substantial art collector who does a lot of contemporary art. And he saw this. It's by a group called Original. Um, and they're a collective that uh, works in technology as well as uh, branding, and, and uh, so they're creative types. One of the things I liked about this is they actually signed it with the function that generated this. So that's the signature there, and they're pointing out that it was the function that generated it. Now, what I'd like to see, and I do think this is beautiful, I think it's really exciting that we're seeing applications like this that's stretching the boundaries of what we think of as AI, which is those equations, or what I think of, because I'm a nerd and that's what I do. So um, what I also wish, though, is that they would have the people who were behind the algorithms and bringing the algorithms together also signed it. Because that's an important part of where we are today is it's not just about the algorithm. It's about the people and the algorithms coming together. And you'll see that as a theme, particularly on the good, somewhat on the bad, and definitely on the beautiful side of my talk today. So how is this done? And, and again, I'm not going to go into the theory behind neural networks and what all is going on there. But it was funny that I came up with this example, because if you, um, if you know that the GAN was created by uh, one of the people who came here and got his PhD in Montreal. I did not choose that to play to the crowd. Um, I actually chose it because I think they are something exciting that's happened in the last couple of years in AI. So these are adversarial networks. So what they're doing is they're working on trial and error, basically. You have one AI that's just taught how to generate stuff, and you have another AI that is looking at it and saying, hmm, is this good or not? And it's trained by what's good or not, by what exists today. Actually, that's a way that humans learn, too. As humans, we actually do a lot of trial and error. That's very much like what's going on in the GANs today. So I'm excited to see this happening. Now, what you see GANs used for mostly is in the image space. This is taking a step out of that image space and going from text to images. So what happened here is a human said, generate flowers that look a certain way. And the GANs started generating those. And they got better and better until they actually created new flowers that looked exactly what the person who specified in text wanted. So as I mentioned, the GANs are great for image generation, improving resolution. So I've got a picture that's not quite good enough. I need better resolution on it. They're fantastic for things like that. They're great for, I need to take this out of the picture, and I need it to fill it in. You'll see that in a lot of the Adobe products. They're really good with that. You may have seen in uh, December of last year, Google's DeepMind announced that they were uh, going to start trying to write the next Harry Potter using GANs. What I think is cool, though, is people in different fields are looking at this. So this is actually a picture from um, some old manuscripts 
uh, their prize, I can't remember the second name now, but they're actually some maritime transcripts. And they're trying to figure out, well, I don't know what these things mean. I don't know what those symbols mean. And there's no one around that can tell us about that. And so what's interesting is the GANs are going in and recognizing when are they similar to each other. Remember, these are all written by different people at different times. When are they similar? They're trying to generate things that are similar so they can see and they can then start categorizing what these are and then relating and trying to understand what does this actually mean. So it's a lot like taking hier hieroglyphics and trying to understand that the same way that these logs are. And I think that, again, that's another exciting way that GANs are being used. That's still in the image space, right? Other people are using it for drug discovery. So they're going in and they're saying, OK, I've got known drugs that work in certain places. Now, how can I create new things that they could solve? What are the combinations of factors that would make this drug work for this? So you're starting to see people that are going in and doing and using these in medical applications. So what we learn in one field, like on images, can actually then apply in other fields like medical. So when you see, and I hear people say this often, you know, oh, but they're just playing games. Why are they playing games? So much learning can be done, and that's really exciting from the games that are being played, that we can then apply it in different areas. And that's what I see is the good that's going on in AI today, is that we're starting in one area, we're really good and good at it in an area that we can understand, drawing pretty pictures of flowers. But then we're taking that next step and we're applying it to history. We're applying it to medical. And then you get something like the last line on here. Someone showing you how you can do it with 50 lines of code. So I get asked all the time, from executives and large companies, because that's who we work with, they say, oh, but how am I ever going to compete with Google and Facebook? How am I ever going to hire those AI PhDs? And I say, you don't have to. They're doing research, and what you're doing is applied. And you can take what they've learned and how they've perfected it, and it's in 50 lines of code. And I promise you, you can, fire, uh, you can find amazing engineers that can write 50 lines of code. So it's all out there, and it's right there. So that's part of the good, too. It's becoming accessible. This is a story of a high school junior, Kavya. She said, I want to learn to code. And she founded a, a nonprofit to do that, actually, when she was a little bit younger than that. Then after her junior year, she said, my grandpa's having some problems with his eyes. I want to help other people. He has access to medical care. I want to help other people learn and diagnose this problem. It relates to diabetes and what could happen. She actually developed an iPhone app. As a junior in high school, using tools like this, she developed an iPhone app. They developed a 3D printed lens to fit on the iPhone. And now they're able to diagnose in very remote places of the world problems with vision related and diagnosing diseases. This is being done by a high school junior. That's how accessible AI is right now. There's tons of applications that are happening. I just grabbed this from O'Reilly's site because they had a nice, compact way of doing it. I could have done it from this site, except it was a little bit longer. I wanted to show a little bit more. Look at what all people are doing. Look around, get inspired, get excited about what's happening because it's not just what's happening in the research. It's how people are applying it and it's how easy it is to apply it. Really easy. If 50 lines of code scared you before, seven better. Again, I want to encourage everybody that's writing 10,000 lines of code in AI. That's awesome. But for those of you that are intimidated by that, know that it's accessible to you, and you can start solving problems with AI right now. So that's the good. What's the bad? You guys hear about things like bias and uh, you know, 
AI, Skynet, you know, going out of control. I don't actually think that's the bad part. I don't think we have to worry about that. I think it's a great thing to talk about and make sure that we're putting checks in place, but I don't think that's where we're going to have a problem. I do think where we're going to have a problem is anthropomorphizing AI. So uh, Jan LeCun has been talking about this quite a bit, and I'm a big supporter of what he's saying. Um, I do agree that there's a lot of BS going on. I think it, like he does too, it's caused a lot from these robot type things. And again, I'm not trying to pick on this one in particular, but Sophia was, um, who is a robot, she was granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia. I think that's a huge mistake for us to start thinking about AI as human. It's a tool for us to use, and it's an exciting tool for us to use, but it isn't human, and granting citizenship to it has all kinds of other problems that we'll talk about in the AI ethics later. Um, the thing that I do think is bad is this comparison with better than human. And so these two things are related. And my problem with that is, that's great, it beats humans sometimes, but humans also beat it sometimes. And maybe it beats us more, but we still beat it sometimes. I think the better metric for all of us to have is, are human and machines together better? So that's one of the bad parts, is we're often pitted as adversaries with the machines, where we should be pitted together, of how do we each help each other? How do we help the AI see things? And how does the AI help us see things? We are absolutely better together. I'm not going to get into that example. This is another one that I want, we'll talk about in the AI um, uh, ethics place, but I did want to bring it up in this more general forum. This bug was not a software bug in the AI. The AI actually, if you, you know about the Uber um, killing a person in Arizona, it wasn't a bug in the AI. It was a bug in the humans. The humans decided to override the AI, not the human in the car, the software engineers. And their reason for that was it gave it a herky-jerky. It was, it was triggering too often. It definitely wasn't triggering too often when it hit the woman, right? We've got to think about these things. And just because they wanted that better user experience of not breaking too often doesn't mean that trade-off should have been done that ended up allowing them to kill someone. Again, not a bug in the AI. It was a bug in the human interface that just made that decision. You may have heard about this in 2015, where Google tagged an African-American woman as a gorilla. What disturbs me more about that is that they didn't go in and fix it. This happened in July of 2015, I think it was. Three years later, it's still not fixed. Still not fixed. The only thing that Google did was go in and not allow things to be tagged as gorillas. We have more responsibility to that than that. We need to take an active stance so that when we find problems like this, we fix it. You cannot convince me that Google couldn't fix this problem. I know they could. This is a matter of priorities for us, and it's us as a community telling our companies that we need to do that. So the bad to me in AI is that we continue to talk about robots and how to make AI like us, when what we need to do is say, how do we make AI, AI help us more? And we need to stop putting things like, oh, that user experience of uh, herky-jerky motion in a car, override that. Override the AI. So this isn't about artificial intelligence. This is about human intelligence. And we need to use ours alongside the AI. So what's the beautiful? 
So I want you guys to get dreamy. Rebecca, when she wrote me and asked me about giving this talk, what she said was, what we want to kick off is for people to be inspired. So when you think about AI, I want AI to be in your dreams. And what's more fun than staring up at the sky and dreaming about what you see in the clouds? What I think is beautiful is that today, in the palm of someone's hand, they can actually get a skin diagnosis for what's happening in their skin. In the palm of their hand, just like the eye diagnosis. That's beautiful. Access to things you couldn't get access before because it's fast and easy and cheap enough to do it. That's beautiful. It doesn't have to be something majorly remarkable like self-driving car. It can be something simple like ask someone a few quick questions and take a picture of their face and give them a great skin diagnosis that helps them in their life better, be better. Another thing that I like, oops, sorry. Another thing that I like is, um, and I think is beautiful, is the fact that my mother-in-law doesn't have to call me about her TV remote anymore. My mother-in-law can talk to her TV remote, and it does what she wants. I would much rather be talking to her about how her day went than which button on her remote she should be pushing to get to the latest World Cup information, right? Isn't it more fun that we're human when we're not talking about that technology that's driving us crazy? I think Comcast has done a fantastic job with their voice remote, and that's all driven by AI. Another place that's exciting is what's going on with AI in crises and humanities crises. So Robots Without Borders is doing a lot of work with uh, crisis organizations of how they can bring AI into those crisis organizations so they can help at that time when people are in the most need. That's beautiful. Benevolent, sorry, Babylon AI is actually repurposing medical treatments that I talked about before. So yeah, with AI, you can fuck cancer. What are your dreams? Because to improve our relationship with AI, to accomplish these things, we need you. We need you dreaming. We need you looking at the clouds. Because you can. Fuck yeah, you can. Thank you.